Good afternoon, everyone. We have a very special guest with us this afternoon. Eminent scholar, prolific writer, well-respected Dhamma teacher and a force for Dhamma propagation in Singapore for scores of years. Please join me to welcome Venerable S. Damika to this interview. Bhante was born in Australia in 1951 and was ordained in the land of the Buddha in 1976. That same, that same year, he went to Sri Lanka to study Buddhist philosophy and meditation. Bhante has published over 25 books and numerous articles in a writing and publishing career that spans over 40 years. His first book, Gemstones of the Good Dhamma, was published in 1987. Another, Good Question, Good Answer, published in 1991, has become a minor Buddhist classic and has since been translated into 36 languages. The Broken Buddha, published in 2006, triggered much discussion in the Theravadian community. His latest book, Footprints in the Dust, Life of the Buddha from the Most Ancient Sources, is an original piece of research that sees through the pages of the Tripitaka to piece together a composite picture of the life of the historical Buddha. It is most fortuitous that this book has been released in time for upcoming visa. Without further ado, I was thinking perhaps we can start with this first question, Bhante, if you're ready. Right. I was wondering if Bhante could start by sharing with us, how did you come to decide to write a book on Buddhist life using only materials from the Pali Canon? What inspired Bhante to take this approach? Well, um, e ever since I became a Buddhist, I, I've been intrigued and fascinated uh, by the uh, the personality of the Buddha, the, the Buddha as our, our teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, for many years, I did a type of meditation which doesn't seem to be very popular amongst uh, Western Buddhists nowadays. That is uh, the Buddhano Sati, the reflecting on the Buddha. And uh, the traditional way of doing this was just basically uh, reciting some verses uh, in, in Pali, uh, Itipiso, Bhagawan, Arham, Samma, Sambuddho, and thinking about them. Yes. And uh, over the years, I've just, as, as I've read the Tupitika, I just noticed so much fascinating information about the Buddha that I hadn't read anywhere else that I thought um, now that uh, coming towards the end of my career, I'm now 70, when I was 60, 68, 67, I decided to put all that information together in, in one book. Um, so it will give the person who is has got some interest in Buddhism um, an alternative view of the Buddha's life. And for those who take the Dhamma very seriously, they may find uh, many pieces of information in the book uh, enhances their understanding of the life of the Buddha, what he actually did do. Yes. And, um, uh, there, of course, there are hundreds, even in English, there are hundreds of books on the life of the Buddha. Yes. Um, most of them consist of a few um, well-known incidents from his life mentioned in the Tipitaka, yes. but combined together with legends and stories that developed sometimes centuries after him. I wanted to just look at what does the Tipitaka say about the Buddha? Yes. And that's very unique because really in most cases, you'll talk about him being a prince, you'll talk about him um, ha having seen the four sides, um, all these big fights with the Mara in the night of enlightenment and so on. But Bhante, you didn't, you, you didn't approach it that way. You had a very different approach. Well, actually, in the 1890s, there was a German scholar, um, uh, Oldenburg, did a book called The Buddha, His Order and His Teaching, I think it's called. Um, and it was translated into English. And it was a, quite an important book at that time because it was based entirely upon um the Pali Pali sources. Oh. 
um, and okay. then and then um, Nyana Moli's uh, definitely a classic. His one, um, um, uh, which is all of the suttas of any size. Yes. About the Buddha, this um, of course I took this to some degree as a model, and another book that uh, I was very uh, I liked very much when I was much younger was was this one, which is an attempt to look at the Buddha from a historical point of view, but it does include many of the later legends. Um, so the, these books sort of, to some degree, influenced how I went about uh, what I did do. Right. And I really appreciate uh, Bhante's effort because um, I, I, I really like that you brought Buddha alive by, your, by, by the way you cast him. Today I read it again and I was telling you earlier and I've, I found that really fascinating. Bhante, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you another question. I love the title a lot. It's strangely poignant and deeply moving. I, I When I was looking at the title, I had this image of this great man who was once there and now he's no more. And less and less of him is left with the passage of time, you know, footprints in the dust. Was that the effect that you wanted? I mean, what is title? Well, I, I wrote an article. I, I did a study of the Buddha's travels quite a few years ago, which I called Footprints in the Dust. Um, but uh, if you look at um, titles of things related to the Buddha, you very, very frequently get in the footprints of the Buddha or in the footsteps of the Buddha. Um, so that is indicates that somebody is following. I wanted to um, talk about the Buddha himself rather than those who were following him or how to follow him. But um, uh, uh, so I decided to call the, the book uh, uh, Footprints in the Dust. And it was only later that I went onto the internet and put that name in to discover that there are quite a few books with that exactly the same name. So some of the guys who went up in the Apollo um, um, rocket to the moon, they wrote a book called Footprints in the Dust. And there is a, another very um, popular book about um, a nurse um, yes, yes. doing um, social work in uh, Afghanistan. She's got a book on that subject. There's a collection of poetry uh, called Footprints in the Dust. And so I was really surprised to see that somebody, uh, quite a lot of people, has stolen my idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to take you slightly different. Um, you know, most books on the Buddha will talk about him leaving the house at 29 and um, enlightened at 35, uh, did his Dhamma propagation work for 45 years, passed away at 80 and so on and so forth. It's just a lot of these dates. Bhante, you don't have those. You don't have the dates like that. But what you do have it's just rich with details about his work, his personality, his mannerism, his habits, daily routines, and so on and so forth. And the ones that I really enjoy were the ones where you spoke about how he treated people, how he was this, this kind, compassionate, understanding person with deep appreciation of human vulnerabilities and so on. And he tried to make people comfortable. I was just wondering why did Bhante left, why did you leave out all those dates? Well, many, perhaps even most of the things that um, even the average person who doesn't know much about Buddhism will know uh, many stories about the Buddha, that he was, say, the son of a king. Well, there, there is not much evidence for that in the Tibetica. Uh, they all know because they saw the film Little Buddha that when he was going through uh, by chariot through a couple of us two, he saw an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a wandering monk, and that was the thing that triggered him to become a uh, to leave his home. Wonderful story, absolutely wonderful, but it's it's not in the Tipitaka. 
Um, I think the most delightful story in the Buddhist tradition about the Buddha was when he was a young prince. Um, he, he rescued a wild goose from his wicked um, uh, cousin Devadatta. This is an absolutely beautiful story, but it's not in the Tipitaka. Um, the Tipitaka doesn't mention even the name Siddhartha. We don't really know what his first name was, even if he had a first name. Uh, Yasodhara, his, uh, what tradition says was the name of his wife, it's not mentioned in the Tipitaka. Now, I want to be very clear. That doesn't mean that these stories are not true. But what it does mean is that the, uh, all the elders who convened the first council, they, if those stories are true, they decided not to put them, uh, to preserve them, um, and probably because they thought they weren't very important. So I have been, I've been very, very strict, as strict as I possibly can, and I'm only looking at what the Tipitaka says. And um, there are quite um, other books like, say, the uh, Lalita Vistara and the Mahavastu, which tell the stories of the Buddha. The, but they date from about three, four, or 500 years after the Buddha. I'm just looking at what the earliest records, the earliest Pali sit, uh, uh, suttas, the, what I would call the core material in the Pali Tipitaka, what does that say about the Buddha? And that is it from that that I have culled all this information. Ah. And, and the other thing which was really interesting is how Bhante has focused considerable attention on the geography of the area where the Buddha had lived. Um, I consider this rather unusual and I was wondering, what, why did you do that? What was the purpose of that? Well, many years ago, on when I was much younger than I am now, I, I was so taken by the Buddha and who he was and what he did was that I undertook some walking tours in India. So I walked from uh, Buddha Gaya to Varanasi, oh, which is where the Buddha walked. Yes, I walked the whole way, going begging with my begging bowl, and at that time I didn't even wear any shoes. And then on another occasion, I walked from Buddha Gaya to Rajagir, or ancient Rajakaha, and then back again. So the, the, the road from Buddha Gaya to Rajagir at one point runs along a line of quite high hills. So I, on the way there, I went on the south side of the hills, and on the way back, I went on the north side of the hills. So, um, and then on another occasion, about a year later, I walked from uh, Rajgir to Kushinara, following what I, I believed was roughly the, 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 the route that the Buddha would have taken. So that was a wonderful experience. I, I wanted to try to experience as much as it would be possible a thousand years later, two thousand years later, what would what would have been like for the Buddha to do those journeys? So I, I had many many interesting experiences, and from that time I've been interested in trying to um, identify as much as possible places where the Buddha went, um, how long it took him to get there. Um, what problems he would have encountered in, in doing, how many people he uh, were in his retinue when he went on these journeys. And so I've managed to, uh, some of the places, of course, are very well known, but there are other places that um, we actually know where they were, but I've, I've never really seen any books that talk about those places. Um, and, and the other thing is I wanted to uh, place the Buddha in a particular place and time. Mm -hmm. So I think to many people, the Buddha is sort of not quite real yeah. because, um, and I wanted to emphasize that he really was a real person. He really did live in a particular location at a particular time. And that's why I did that. Yes. I've got two questions from this. One, how long did you take to make that journey? 
Oh, well, the journey, there were the three journeys altogether. Uh, it's, um, look, I got it in my diary. The, the first one from um, Budagaya to Varanasi, that took me, um, I, I remember, I think it was about two and a half weeks. Um, mainly because on one or two occasions I got lost. <laughs> I, I didn't always know. I didn't always follow the road because I thought, you know, I'll take a shortcut uh, that will be, and it ended up being longer. And um, for example, when you cross the Son River between uh, Budagaya and Varanasi is the Son River, which is a very, very wide river. And it was just such a beautiful place. I spent a day or two there and just across the river up in a, a very steep hill is a, an inscription of King Asoka. So I, I sort of, spent some time looking at that. So I, I wasn't walking the whole way, although I slept out in the open most of the time. So it was about two and a half weeks. The The journey from uh, Rajgir to um, Kushinara, that took me two weeks. Only two weeks? Yes. To walk? I mean, yeah. But they, you so didn't some, catch, your ride, catch your right somewhere. You, you walk. No, no, I walked the whole way. Oh, wow. And and this is the interesting thing too. What's that? I said that's in the footsteps of the Buddha. That's the real trilling in the footsteps of the Buddha. Yeah, it it was difficult, and at times it was trying. But I, I found it extremely in, enriching. I, I I do recall that I I begged for food all of the way, and many villages in India nowadays have no idea what. A Buddhist monk with a bowl standing at their door means, yeah. but for the most part, people did actually give me stuff, and to my great astonishment, I never got sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Second question. And I recall yes. when I went to when I went all the way to Rajikaha, uh, and then I came back again. I stayed in the Thai temple in Buddha Gaya, uh -huh. and they asked me where I've come from. And I said, I've come from Varanasi. And they said, you took the bus? And I said, no, I walked. And they just couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> My second question, Bante, do you have a copy of the book that you wrote on the geography, the, all those eight places? Do you, do you still have it in that? Um, oh, that's that's my book, uh, Middle Land, Middle Way. Well, that's on all of the places. That doesn't really have very much yeah. um, information about what we're talking about now, a little bit, but not much. And, of course, that was written, I think, in 1990 or 1991. So I've learned a lot more. You know, now with um, Google Earth, you can find lots of things that you <laughs> you wouldn't find in any books. Oh my gosh, I am so inspired. I wish I could do the, that same journey. Um, but probably I won't do a very good job. Halfway through, I'm probably going to catch a ride from someone. <laughs> Bante, I have another question for you. In many of your, I, I mean, I noticed that in the book, there were uh, many of your notes were to Sanskrit texts. What was the purpose mm. of that? Well, um, I, I have an interest in what are called the Dharma, uh, Dharma Sutras, which are the early uh, Brahminical law books. Um, so they tell us quite a lot about the society in India a century to maybe three centuries after the Buddha. But they talk about um, practices and cultural um, practices and that would probably also being done at the time of the Buddha. So you can get some idea of uh, uh, life uh, that uh, the Buddha may have lived and his contemporaries may have lived from those books. But I didn't want to introduce any of that information into the text of the book itself because I didn't want to break the, um, the, oh. the flow of the narrative. But I'll give you an example. So, for example... Suddhodana had two um, two wives, uh -huh. Mahamaya and Mahapajapati Gautami. Now, we really don't know whether he was married to both of them at the same time or that he married the second one after the first one died. So if you look in the Dhamma Sutras, 
uh, the, the ancient law books, it actually says that it was quite normal, it was considered acceptable if a man married a woman and she died, that he should uh, or that he could marry uh, her younger sister, which may have happened in the case of um, Suddhodana. Um, another example is where I use the Upanishads. So, for example, probably most Buddhists know the Sigulavada Sutta. So the young man, Sigula, um, is, is walking around with his hair wet and the Buddha asks him, what he's doing. And he says, well, when before my father died, he asked me to carry on the family tradition and um, worship the six directions. And then the Buddha gives his famous um, discourse on social relations. Well, if you look in the Upanishads, it actually tells you how uh, that practice of worshipping the six directions, and in some Upanishads, the eight directions, and in some Upanishads, mm, uh, the intermediate um, directions as well. So I've just put that note in there so that people know that this is not an invention. It was actually a practice that was done at that time. I see. So I've, I've sort of enhanced or enriched some of the meagre details from the Tripitaka with information from the uh, early Sanskrit literature, but I've put them generally in the notes. Okay. No, I, those are very useful. I mean, I find myself, I do find myself wanting to go and check out these materials from Google. I mean, I don't have hmm. those materials. They've all been translated into English, right? Because I, I can't read Sanskrit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But most of them are. But I mean, they are a very... Um... I mean, most people don't read them. <laughs> they're, they're rather obscure literature, but they are available. Um, uh, here's another one. Um, it's just recalled. In, there's one sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where there's a Brahmin woman, a Brahmini, yes. and she's very taken with the, with the Buddha, and one day she trips and nearly falls. Yes. And as she nearly falls, she says, Buddhang Saranangatami. Yes, yes. Uh, sort of, as we may say, oh, God help me, something like that. And a, a very conservative Brahmin, perhaps a member of her family, hears this, and he's very angry because he doesn't like the Buddha. And so he says, he, he scolds her and he says, you should be degraded. So if you look in the, what, what does he mean by that? Well, if you look in the Dhamma Sutras, um, it, it, it tells you that there was a particular way of expelling somebody from the Brahmin community if they did certain things. And one of the things uh, which you could be expelled or excommunicated was if you worshipped um, non-Vedic ascetics. So I give the reference to that there, and that probably is what the Brahmin meant, that she should be excommunicated uh, from our community because she she likes the Buddha better than the Vedic sages. Ah, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, so, so that uh, some of that uh, literature just adds a little um, understanding to some of the things in the Tripitaka. Right. Thank you. Um, but yeah, as, you, as you are aware, I'm, I'm kind of an amateur writer myself. I remember when I finished writing Between the Lines, I was not completely satisfied. I kept having new ideas, more ideas. I wanted to add more things, but I didn't because I, you know it took a while to write a book. I was just wondering mm. whether Bhante had a similar experience and if you would like to share with us, what were some of the additional ideas that you might have added if you had more time? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, the book's only come out um, three or four weeks ago and already <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I, gee, I could have added this or I could have added that. Not very much, but some. But I, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, when I had finished the book, but before it went into the printers, I was going through the internet uh, through Google Image, I think it was, and up popped a, a picture of Jesus smiling, a very lovely painting of Jesus with some children, and she was, uh, and he was smiling. And I thought, 
Well, I, I, I know the Bible fairly well, and I thought, well, that's interesting because nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus smiled or even, uh, that he laughed or even that he smiled. And then I thought, did the Buddha smile? Well, yes, he, he certainly did. So then I, I, I think, because I can recall quite a few places where it mentions that the Buddha smiled, so uh, I spent quite some time trying to find them because they're very brief references, but I found them and I just added a note. It was too late to change the text itself. I just added a note saying that um, sometimes the Buddha uh, situation was such that the Buddha was able to smile. So it was just a little thing that I added at the end. And there are one or two other small things that um, maybe if the book ever has a um, uh, a second edition might go into it. Will you be looking at a second edition? Oh, well, look, it's quite some time before these books are all distributed. They are free, of course, but uh, so we'll, we'll wait and see. I, uh, your book is definitely a bestseller, bestseller. Um, well, it's not being, it's not, it's, as you know, it's not being sold. I know, I Let's know. just say hopefully it will be popular. Or it will, it will attract it. Yes. Um, we do have a bit more time, Bante. Do you mind taking yes, more, more questions? I was wondering what were some of your biggest challenges when you were writing this book? Hmm. Um, I can't really think of anything. I, I wasn't any under any pressure. But perhaps like uh, you mentioned, your, your book was on the life of the Buddha. It's, it's got quite a good title too. Be the, what's it called again? The Buddha Between the Lines, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so when it was nearly finished, there was sort of a pressure to want to get it over and done with, to, to, to finish it and see it almost like, um, I don't know, having a baby. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you, want the, you want the little guy to come out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so towards the end, I, I, I kept on hoping that, you know, now is it, now's the time, it, it, it's finished, but then I could inevitably think of something else or improve something else. So, oh, and, and incidentally, I should say quite a few people, um, uh, I mentioned them in the, uh, in the, at the beginning of the book, helped me a great deal. So two people, including uh, Professor Peter Harvey, went through the text and made many suggestions to me. So one of the suggestions he made was um, that I haven't included very much about the Buddha's meditation. And so I, I was very grateful for that because that, uh, then I, um, I mean, I had thought of it before, but actually the Buddha talks about meditation very frequently and he describes meditation practice very frequently, but there are very few places where it actually mentions what type of meditation he did. And that's why I, I already knew that. And that's why I didn't in, uh, include anything, but he encouraged me to include at least something. So I did, did manage to talk a bit more about meditation or write a bit more about meditation. Uh, so as for challenges, I'm, not really. I mean, I, I've been sort of thinking about and, and um, contemplating on a book like this for a long, long time. And as I would go through the Tipitika, where I'd see some unusual, even a minor piece of information, I would make a note of it. Um, so I, I, I had all the information either in my head or in my, my notes. Uh, uh, here's one, for example. It mentions, actually, the Buddha mentions several times that when he would meditate, he would always put his robe over his head like this. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, several, people who have, several people who have read the draft of the book have said they never, they've never noticed that before. Well, it is, it's in there. And then it raises the question, Really, he put his robe over his head. Why did he do that? So I speculate that well, maybe he did it to keep the light from his eyes, or maybe he did it to stop insects buzzing in his face. I, I, I don't know. But there's a piece of information that um, uh, I already had notes on. 
Oh. So I just made these notes, had a general idea, and I put it all together without too many, too many challenges. The word speaks of your familiarity, so deep, deep familiarity with all the random pieces of information throughout this it throughout the Nikayas. It's just everywhere. And, and it's amazing how you manage to pick them out and make them significant. I mean, no one would have paid attention to, to this little bit. And oh, and that takes me to one, one question that I asked you, I, that I had mentioned to you much earlier. I when I saw, because I was reading your book today, and I I I, I spotted this little piece of information and straight away I wanted to go find it in the Nikayas. Where is it? Then I realized that your footnotes were in the Pali Text Society, I think. Um, the compilation there. So I wasn't... The, uh, all my notes are from the page numbers of the Pali Text Society editions of the Tipitaka. Yes. So I was wondering if Bhante... Could I take this opportunity to ask you to help me understand how to track this down in the Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, edition? Well, if you if you look at the uh, top left hand corner of the uh, sorry the right hand corner of the left hand page, okay. you will always see um, a Arabic number and a uh, yes. Latin number. Yes. So two, uh, maybe 55 yes. Roman numerals, three. Yes. So 55 will refer to the page in the Pali Text Society's e editions of the Tipitaka, and the Roman numeral will, will refer to the volume. Then if you look at the page in English, somewhere in the page, you will see a number in, da in brackets yes. in bold type. That refers to the page number of the Polytex editions. Ah, Polytex I have to find that. It's really quite simple. Okay. Right. I have one final question for Bhante. Um, it's just, just a question of curiosity. I'm just wondering, because I, I'm a big fan of your work, of all your books. Mm. And I'm just wondering, after this incredible book, what other writing projects can we look forward to from Bhante? Mm, well, I, I haven't decided yet, but I would like to do something else. What I'm considering is the second and third chapter of my book. The second chapter is about, it's a, an account of what society was like at the time of the Buddha, as is depicted in the Pali Tipitaka. And chapter three is about uh, the religion of the time, Brahmanism, uh, the Ajivakas, the, the um, non-aligned um, ascetics, the um, Jains, etc. So I, I thought perhaps it might be uh, useful for people to elaborate upon that and write a full book on the world in which the Buddha lived and look at uh, how and why he was uh, to some degree influenced by those things. Now, I'm not a person who believes that the Buddha was uh, or that his Dhamma was influenced by the religious um, uh, beliefs at the time, but there is absolutely no doubt that he used the lingo of the time. He, uh, uh, he was very well acquainted with Vedic, um, uh, the Vedic hymns and the Brahminical practices and what have you, and he often commented upon them. And he used some of their terminology. Uh, so knowing something about what the religious world was like at that time gives some background and, and information uh, about why the Buddha said and did certain things. Right. So I, I, I thought I might do a book on um, ancient India as depicted um, 
in the Pali Tipitaka, once again, with some supplementary uh, material from early Sanskrit literature as well, including Jain literature. Absolutely fascinating. I so look forward to this. Mm. Yeah, oh, it hasn't been done yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're very prolific, right? I mean, I, I know you write very fast. 40 years writing career, 25 books, that's one book every other year. This just came out, so perhaps, mm. perhaps, perhaps in a couple of years' time, you will be having this conversation again? Well, um, maybe. Um, maybe I, I might just add one thing uh, before we finish, okay. is that uh, one thing I noted, because in preparation for this book, I, I read both online and, um, and books from my own library on the life of the Buddha, um, and what I noticed is that if you get a book on the life of the Buddha, maybe roughly a third will actually be about the life of the Buddha, and the rest of it will be about the Buddha's Dhamma. And there's, there's nothing wrong with this. But um, I, I think the reason this happens is because there really isn't much... Um, for, for most people, at least, there really isn't very much information. They just repeat the same things about he was the son of a king and his mother was this, she died, and and so on and that. Um, and so to, to make a full-size volume, they need to include some others, so they go into the, the Buddhist teaching. Well, if you're interested in the Buddhist teaching, don't read my book because I really don't have very much about what the Buddha taught this is a biography of the Buddha. It was the Buddha as he was depicted in the Pali Tipitaka, the Buddha as a human being, his habits, his, his daily routine, how he went for Pindapata, yes. what happened when he went for Pindapata and he didn't get anything, <laughs> and so on. So this is actually, um, uh, it's not really about the teachings of the Buddha. There is one chapter, a very brief chapter, where I look at some of the things that the Buddha taught which are not widely known, or it seems to me that um, some of the things like um, the Buddha's attitude towards the theatre and um, poetry and things like this. Um, he did have some things to say on those subjects. So I did, uh, there's one chapter, small chapter, which deals with certain things that the Buddha taught, but most of it is actually about the man himself. Yes, yes. And I think that's, that's perfectly beautiful because, um, you know, Bhante, we have always been taught as Buddhists to draw inspiration from Buddha Dhamma Sangha so much to be inspired by the Dhamma, but there's so much more to be to be said about life of the Buddha to inspire us. Mm. I think your book is a beautiful, wonderful book that will inspire many. Oh, thank, thank you. I, 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 I mean, you know, I am a Dhamma scholar, and I've been, I, I have been in this learning about the, the Buddha, learning about the Dhamma since 1992, one day. It's 30 years. And still, I find myself marveling at the kind of materials, the sort of observations that you made, the conclusions you, you drew. I thought it was marvelous. I really love this book. And above all, your book is written like a scholar, but not for a scholar. The, the research you made, was, it will stand up to scrutiny in any scholastic community but it was written for us, the world, the people, everyone. In fact, I'm going to pass it to my mom and ask her to read it because I think <sighs> she will love it too. My mom loves re reading about books on the book there. So, yeah, well, I, I wanted to, um, I, I mean, it's, it's not a scholarly work. Um, there are plenty of those. Um, but I wanted it to have a scholarly bent while at the same time being accessible, and I, I think I managed to achieve that, but we will see what other people have to say about it as it becomes more widely known. Yeah, I, I think it should be. I, I, I would really urge everyone who's listening to this video to, if you cannot get a hard copy of the book, get it from... Uh, the link that we will put at the end of this interview, we'll put on a link. Oh, uh, yes. It, it is on open access now, so people can read it on the on the internet. 
Yes, thank you so much, Bante. I would like okay. to really thank, thank you. you. Bante. Thank you so much for agreeing to spend this time with us, sharing with us the thought processes, the considerations that you, you had when you were writing this book. It's very rich. It's a very enriching experience for me and for, for I, I, I believe everyone else who will chance to watch this, this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you.